OSIRIS-REx space mission and its first uh, results that we obtained. So um, it's uh, in the context of, context of small bodies, this space mission is uh, by NASA. So it's, um, the aim is to send a spacecraft and grab uh, some sample safely from an asteroid and bring it back to the Earth uh, to analyze in the data. So the idea is uh, simple, but there is a lot of uh, context uh, information and a uh, lot of um, things to be, care be, uh, be careful about because um, as easy as it sounds, it's not very uh, easy. And it's uh, in the context of small bodies to understand uh, the formation of the solar system and eventually the beginning of life. So as you see here, OSIRIS Flex Space Mission has a different, um, it's an acronym made of different words. So uh, the idea is to understand the origins of the solar system uh, by analyzing in detail the sample that will be returned to the Earth later, and also uh, to investigate spectrally uh, the asteroid and to compare uh, to our understanding what we had before. Uh, because prior to sending the spacecraft, we had to characterize the, space, uh, the, the asteroid in question, which is uh, Bennu, um, which is the nearest asteroid. So um, uh, to compare the results you had before from the ground-based instruments and space-based telescopes, and to uh, see how it uh, matters and how it differs, and to refine the modeling using the spectral uh, data we would have. And also, another part is the resource identification. So this is uh, very important for the future space missions, because you, you uh, in, in terms of uh, space travel, interplanetary travel, at some point we would need to uh, identify resources that would be important for the, the, the astronauts that would be going there, or even the purpose like asteroid mining, which is becoming a very interesting uh, topic in recent decades. So the, on the other hand, this is also important. And also, there's another factor which is very crucial, uh, which is the part of uh, security. So that is for the planetary defense. So um, this is the, especially the uh, understanding and characterization of the Yarkovsky uh, effect, which changes the orbits of small bodies, very irregular orbits all the time, and uh, could uh, uh, potentially impact planets, and uh, especially in inner uh, planets. And so this is also, in, in this context, it's also important. And also the regolith explorer, which means to understand the sample that would be returned from the spacecraft um, and uh, to get the contextual information about uh, the sample. So unlike the meteorites, to which we have the access to have an understanding about the formation and because they come from asteroids, but uh, knowing the context of uh, the, where the samples come from uh, is uh, really important uh, in order to uh, uh, see how uh, the models that we have currently about the meteorites and uh, uh, the asteroid families uh, converge. So this is um, uh, the basic idea so of, of the entire mission. So the mission was uh, launched in, uh, uh, in 2016. And um, uh, the to the asteroid Bennu, it took about uh, two years. In 2018, in December, the spacecraft got to the asteroid after several trajectories. So it's uh, uh, very small asteroid, about uh, 490 uh, 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 meters of diameter. And uh, it's a B-type asteroid, so it's spectral characterized as B-type, B -type, so you have the uh, reflectance that uh, goes down or the wavelengths uh, from, um, uh, if you uh, transit from the near ultraviolet to the near uh, infrared. So it's a uh, spectrally B-type asteroid. And um, uh, now we are at the asteroid. Since, to, uh, since December, and the uh, characterization phase is in progress, and the return to uh, the Earth of the samples is expected in 2023. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, so this is a, um, the basics, uh, the, the first results we had before the spacecraft. So we had um, several radar measurements, uh, because it's an Apollo asteroid, so it gets closer to the Earth uh, every six years, more or less. From this, uh, when you have a good uh, radar telescopes and um, when it's the asteroid within like about 30 lunar radii, you can uh, have uh, sufficient measurements to get the, uh, uh, get data about the asteroid, do some astrometry, and to understand the uh, um, the uh, orientation of the asteroid, and also to make a primary shape model because in space mission you have to have to make the space mission uh, work and make plans uh, for uh, uh, 
uh, it works, you have to have beforehand, before you go to the asteroid, uh, you have to have an idea about the orientation of the asteroid and the size of it. So for this, we have to have an uh, early estimation about the, uh, about, uh, the shape. So this you can get from a photometry, or but in radar you have better accuracy. And this is also um, uh, um, uh, retrograde orbiter, so it's um, orbiting light. Uh, it's uh, around that, so it has an uh, obliquity of more than 100 degrees. So, um, so this is what you see in the radar measurements and the reconstructed shape model here. Um, and also it has a, uh, we got a, uh, one of the special results was is the, the measurement of the density of the spacecraft using a technique that was never used before. So normally you use uh, perturbations from the gravity on the spacecraft or other planets or uh, in binary systems to measure the density, you get the mass estimates. But here it was the measurements of, uh, uh, we had to combine different measurements, which I would go in detail later. And then so it's a very dark object, about 4% of uh, al albedo. So the uh, timeline of the mission is, uh, um, uh, for now we are in 2019 towards the end, so the, uh, and now it's the asteroid operations to uh, find, to get the sample sites. So you arrive at asteroids and uh, you try to uh, uh, find areas which are, which contain very fine material for the sampling uh, mechanisms to work. Uh, and to find potential areas which would be interesting scientifically and also without any hazard to the spacecraft, so security is number one. However scientifically interesting may be, uh, the priority is for the spacecraft security, so the sampling site should not be an area which is high near the poles, and um, uh, you should not be uh, having a lot of boulders which could, uh, which could damage the spacecraft in, in case. So now we are in the phase of uh, selecting sample sites, and later on this year, we would uh, transition uh, to uh, the uh, final sampling site. And then uh, in next year, in uh, July 2020, would be the sample uh, acquisition. And then uh, we could stay in, uh, in the spacecraft, uh, uh, the return trajectory from uh, this, the Bennu uh, starts in about 2021 in March. And that would, uh, having the trajectories that bring back uh, the samples back to the Earth 2023 uh, in September. And uh, because uh, it's a space mission without a lot of constraints, the, that's good news that we could still stay until 2020 April. And still there are trajectories that would bring the spacecraft back still in 2023 September uh, for the time of delivery in case uh, some uh, flexible adjustments would be needed. So this is the entire mission and then we follow the sample analysis on the laboratories. So uh, this is uh, a bit, bit of details uh, of what's going on. So we had like um, the approach, approach phase in 2018 late. So this was more or less validating uh, the already we had informations we had uh, from the ground-based instruments. And then uh, transiting the preliminary survey. Uh, and then now um, we um, have different uh, ob observation uh, uh, techniques, different orbits to uh, which would uh, which would translate into the uh, important uh, incident and uh, emission angles or observations, and then um, now we've yesterday we got the official announcement of like four sampling sites, which I will show later, and then this uh, starting from September, so in, in about uh, one month, uh, we would start uh, reconnaissance phase of the space uh, this, this four sites, so there will be. Um, better characterization of these four sites to uh, nail down to two sites with a primary and a backup site by the end of December, and to which we would perform uh, the uh, rehearsals uh, to better characterize with low pass orbits and uh, to uh, find out uh, which is the real uh, the site that we would be interested to uh, go for the satellite in uh, July 2020. So spacecraft got uh, plenty of instruments, uh, very interesting. Uh, so you have, there are two spectrometers. So uh, one works from uh, visible about 400 uh, nanometers up to about 4.3 microns. So you uh, have a really understanding about spectral properties. And also as a thermal emission spectrometer, going from 5 microns up to 50 microns. Um, and then we also have a suite of cameras, three cameras. So uh, it's, uh, it's called OCAMS. 
and these are for Occam's come to the three cameras, main uh, uh, camera Polycam, which is, uh, which is a, a camera for uh, very narrow angle camera to observe in higher uh, spatial resolution uh, the surface, and also a map cam, which is uh, this special resolution camera, but uh, with uh, four filters invisible to characterize the spectral properties, and also a sample camera, so when the sample mechanism uh, would take place, it would be uh, giving the evidence that uh, uh, how the sampling would go on. So these three is the camera suits. And also, um, uh, we also have a laser altimeter. So this is to refine the chain models. Once you, once you arrive at the asteroid, we need a better high resolution chain model in order to uh, um, make digital terrain models in order to evaluate these drops on the surface. Uh, without um, any obstacles or any uh, boulders present. So this, for this, first, once you first you depend on the shape model that's made from images uh, using like uh, stereo photogrammetry techniques. But then uh, once you have this model, you need to refine when you want to realize and touch down on spacecraft using a very high um, uh, resolution, uh, uh, about like several centimeters um, resolution uh, of uh, shape model, which is very important. And also, um, there is a, a regular X-ray imaging spectrometer, which is a, an instrument which is completely led by uh, students to, uh, to characterize the elemental abundances on the surface. So, um, uh, yeah, the, the cameras have like, different purposes, and sometimes, um, for uh, give you an idea about polycam, about the spatial resolution, at about uh, um, 100 kilometers away, uh, one pixel would translate to about uh, 1.3 uh, meters, whereas Mapcam would be about uh, five of these uh, pixel, polycam pixels uh, at the same distance, and the same cam is in between. And so this would uh, provide com comprehensive coverage about the instrument, uh, about the instrument, uh, about characterization. And so, so you have this um, uh, uh, four filter bands uh, around 460, 550. Uh, 700, 860 nanometers to uh, these are the bands that we use normally for asteroid observations to characterize and get an uh, idea about the uh, mineral minerals that would present because of the highest special resolution they could nail down on areas that would be interesting and then using the spectrometer, uh, visible spectrometer, always we could um, get a better uh, understanding about the um, the, uh, the minerals that are present. Yeah, so these are again these four instruments. And uh, OLA is uh, especially, uh, it's a Canadian instrument, I should say, it's um, British for Canada, the two uh, instruments and other instruments, all the working instruments. And all the instruments have been working so far. And um, REXIS is still undergoing uh, um, calibration, so it's observing radio sources um, and it's still we didn't have any uh, results uh, so far. So um, uh, this is a quick slide about the uh, how the sampling would work. So um, this sample head here is uh, about 33 centimeters diameter. So um, you have to get uh, this. Uh, uh, this is the touch and go mechanism. So you you were like touching surface for about five seconds and then going away. So as soon as it touches down, there's a nitrogen gas that would come up and that would stir up the regolith particles inside the, uh, uh, within this, uh, uh, the, the uh, touch and go um, uh, sample acquisition head. And then it would uh, uh, get, get the samples inside and then uh, it would uh, seal them and then would pack, uh, uh, put it back to the uh, sample uh, container. And so this is uh, how it works. And also, uh, one of the important uh, parts of the uh, aspects of this mission is that uh, because um, there is an extended um, uh, sampling arm, we are able to measure um, the amount of uh, sample uh, collected in, in grams. Normally, we plan here for about 60 grams. If you compare this with uh, the previous sample results, like the Hybusa mission, uh, less than one gram, and now Hybusa stands uh, two times sampling. 
so this is, uh, the expectation is much higher, and also because of the extension and uh, using the uh, change of angular momentum, uh, they, they, uh, you can perform uh, two rotations before and after sample rotation to measure the amount of uh, the, uh, the grams of samples that is uh, already. Been. So this is also blank after sample rotation. So, yeah. What is the size? Do you expect to to with this? One 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 uh, yes. one grains or, 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 or it's just for us. It's uh, grains as uh, big as one uh, one centimeter of the diameter. Yeah, feel free to ask questions as you go on. So, uh, as soon as the arrival of the um, at the asteroid, the idea was to find some uh, um, satellites that might be present or some dust particles. So, uh, the area, um, um, uh, so first, like we using the camera, looking for these natural satellites. There were several researchers uh, from about 300 meters of. Uh, uh, radius at 500 meters and one kilometer away, and uh, this uh, first analysis didn't lead to any findings. So it was decided that it was safe for the instrument and for the spacecraft to come and insert into orbit around the asteroid. And it was indeed the, the first, the smallest object ever to be orbited by a, sp a spacecraft. So, um, so when you compare with the early ground-based uh, data, so this is what. Uh, what we got. Um, yeah, um, the ground-based data, radar data, could indicate about the boulders that was present about, and the uh, largest boulder was estimated to be about 10 meters, but the reality was a bit different, and um, it was highest boulder would be largest boulder would be about 50 meters of size, as you can see. Uh, it's the thing here. So it's uh, it's the southern hemisphere here. It's sort of like that. So it comes here and it goes on. So this was actually underestimated the size. And the early estimates in, uh, indicated also fine grain material. And the reality was very different from this. So uh, here is a high resolution image. And uh, as you can see, um, um, so it's now it's reversed uh, upside of it. Uh, North Pole is up. Uh, so, um, you could see a lot of albedo variations in this like uh, close, uh, it's, uh, it's low phase angle that image. Uh, a few more images that put together to make this GIF. And um, it's uh, apparently it's a uh, place with a lot of cool and uh, uh, nothing the mission was expected or designed uh, uh, to, uh, to sample. So this was uh, beginning a challenge. So now the mission is now addressing, trying to address this and to find uh, way to sample the areas that are smaller than planned before. Okay. So um, this is the, uh, one of the early images. And this image is about 33 pixels per uh, an image, uh, per, uh, 30, 33 centimeters a pixel. And indeed, this is uh, so the sampling would be one of the pixels in this image as to keep it right here as it is. And um, here you could see. Uh, some structures um, <coughs> uh, and there are some candidate craters, and this uh, is very diverse geological. We have uh, different morphological um, units that are present, and there are different albedo variations. So, um, these are like the two largest boulders <coughs> that are present. And, um, this uh, indicate because uh, this um, current understanding was the Bennu was uh, aggregate from uh, collational uh, disruption of a larger body, and this large uh, boulders are, are supposed to be uh, are thought to be of uh, um, Bennu's uh, progenitor, which means that um, it could be a part that are even older, and um, or it could be uh, some parts of uh, impact. So this is still like. Um, under investigation. Yeah. So, um, as you can see here, there are like several interesting areas. So, in the southern hemisphere, there's like a lot of wildery rich areas here, here around here. And uh, so, we find some like wilder sort of free areas around here. 
and uh, probably here and like several like greater candidates. So these are the ones, uh, the areas that are more or less interesting for samplings because of the security of the spacecraft and the uh, way the space sampling is designed. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, production. And yeah, so so also uh, to give an idea of the, um, this is in a high phase angle image, so you can see the shadows, which uh, could give you an idea about uh, how the prospect uh, renders. So these are like these units here. That seems to be a of like in a unit with large depth, but here, as you see, uh, for like a few minutes away, uh, for 70 minutes apart from this image, it rotates in like that, and then you can see the shadow that is cast on here, so indicating the crater nature of this. And this is a crater about what, 40 meters in, in diameter. So, if you are a geologist, this is like a very interesting uh, place to investigate. And um, this is the largest boulder uh, you can see here, and it's about uh, uh, called Ben Ben, and it's uh, more than 50 meters of uh, in its largest dimension. So if you pursue it, you can see you see it in uh, like oblique leaf, so it gives you know, estimate about its height about more than 20 meters. So it's, this was uh, present. This was uh, present in the original uh, radar-based shape model, but it was uh, size was still underestimated. So even, um, this is uh, one other bull that's present, and this image shows that. Yeah. So uh, one of the uh, interesting results was this: uh, as soon as we arrived and during the even during the approach phase, we could find a very uh, distinct uh, uh, absorption band at 2.7 microns, um, indicating the aqueous alteration all over Venu. So here you see um, um, on a black curve this uh, uh, absorption band. So it's um, even it's locally present. So here um, the footprint is like uh, the instrument footprint. So it, um, um, the orbits is always spectral data, and it's um, uh, so the, the uh, spacecraft is uh, this um, asteroid is inside. Are completely, and it's about field factor over 40 percent. Um, so it's even with this, you can see this band percent, and its band depth varies to up to about 20 percent. So it, it has a diversity uh, uh, across the surface. So if you look at the um, uh, meteorite data, the best candidates are CM1 and CM2 meteorites, and. Um, um, <coughs> We are trying to plan um, um, to uh, better characterize it uh, using the data that, is, that are coming. So this is like very an interesting results, and uh, which confirms that uh, we must experience exfiltration. And also, we are at work, uh, investigating whether there's a uh, 0.7 micron band present, because sometimes uh, there's correlation with this band, and thus far we did not find any uh, correlation um, to uh, as a complacent. And um, one more result that is interesting is the Venu is uh, accelerating its rotation, so it's spinning up. Has been observed for many, uh, many uh, asteroids. So uh, we were able to using the previous observations um, and the current observations, uh, we were able to find that Venu is uh, spinning up. So um, this is a validation of the Europe uh, spin. And uh, here are some like uh, albedo variations. So um, normally, all of, all, if you average spin, it would be about 4.5, 4 4.4% 4 uh, uh, of albedo. But uh, there are some areas which about 15% of uh, uh, normal albedo, uh, for example, here. Some areas which are still being characterized to ask what the nature of these features are. Because these are the image data, and uh, you have to have very uh, close orbits to get the spectrometer's uh, footprints on the surface and uh, to get uh, them uh, inside the bore site of the instruments uh, in order to characterize uh, what the minerals that, that represent. So in case 
this, uh, this unit is um, around here about 50% uh, of the normal albedo. And uh, some phasal borders seem to be very reflective. And um, especially the feature like Ben Ben, which was the largest border, which has very steep <coughs> face, uh, has very uh, high, uh, high reflectance. Yeah, um, so I'm just going to talk about the measurement of uh, 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 how the measurement of uh, first measurement of the density was done. So this, these are like a, a spinning uh, tops, so it, it depends on if, if they're a retrograde or prograde rotator. So as as you have an object that uh, rotates um, and uh, which is a, a small size, like um, several kilometers of size, these objects. Uh, because the Yarkovsky effect. Um, or the times it could change the which is already because if it's, um, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's rotating uh, prograde, it would, uh, you, you are, uh, you, you are, uh, your knife is behind the back and then you, you, are, you are removing, uh, the, you are emitting your thermal radiation and then uh, it slows down. And then uh, you, as a result, your, um, your, uh, uh, orbit gets extended, so your simulator axis increases. And if you are a retrograde uh, rotator like Venu, you are falling in, spiraling into the sun, so your simulator axis uh, decreases. So in the case of Venu, this uh, you need like uh, to get good observation. You have to have like uh, several uh, observations. Uh, since Venu has six uh, six years of serial period with the Earth, every six years you get a chance to observe Venu. So for discovery. Of it was in 1999 and after 2005, 2011. These three, uh, um, from these three uh, uh, periods, the observations uh, um, uh, led to the finding of uh, the, uh, the arrow cosmic phase, so we could measure the rate of change of uh, the same major axis. And then um, we could find a deviation about 106 kilometers from the, for, uh, the orbit that would be projected computationally. Uh, we compare with the 2011 data. And then uh, there's thermal emission data from Spitzer, uh, just called uh, in 2007, which uh, gave us uh, the, uh, um, uh, uh, which allowed us to characterize the acceleration and using the force model, the orbit of all these uh, perturbations, uh, you, you are able to uh, get a mass estimate and then uh, the density using the shape model you have and uh, uh, already did the radar data. So um, this is uh, one, one of the first attempts and uh, we got a value of like uh, 1,260 kilograms per uh, cubic uh, meters. Uh, and uh, this was uh, one of the results waiting to be validated at the arrival of the spacecraft. So uh, at the arrival of the spacecraft, we've seen the uh, perturbations uh, and also um, other uh, measurements, um, local data. We were able to get to about uh, um, this value, as the bulk density of uh, 1,190. Uh, kilograms per square meter, uh, kilometers, uh, and uh, so this is within one sigma of uh, the previous measurement that was done uh, using astrometric radar data. Uh, so which validates uh, uh, this technique and which uh, sort of uh, points towards uh, using these techniques uh, if uh, you have, uh, if you are able to get a good characterization of the object uh, using uh, several uh, several observations uh, consecutively with uh, higher accuracy. So um, um, you can also get some data from optical navigation and also delta uh, Doppler ranging. So here it's like you are you are using two telescopes, uh, the deep space network, and you're seeing uh, distant. Uh, so um, yeah, so this is uh, um, uh, this is one of the, one of the first and which is uh, one of the results. Yeah, uh, and also one of the uh, results that was sort of uh, unexpected uh, because uh, early thermal inertia insights uh, predicted uh, that the uh, uh, storage would be homogeneously uh, covered by fine regolith uh, material, but it was not, in fact, and it was uh, dominated by large borders higher than one, kilo, one, one meters dimension. So this was uh, one of the interesting results. And so this is uh, a tweak, but still the inner thermal inertia value was uh, consistent uh, more, um, 
more or less uh, with the observation with the data that we have beforehand. So, and now the thermal models need to be tweaked uh, in order to get uh, um, equal more uh, more uh, more parameters and uh, to refine. So this was all then expected. So, and the, the uh, biggest surprise of Ben yet is that we discovered some uh, dust particles that emanated from the surface of the building. So this was uh, early January, and we were just uh, using the navigation camera observations. Then uh, one of these images was, uh, was uh, this is a combination of two images, um, which gives an insight that some particles emanating from surface are visible. So this was, uh, means that Beno is uh, uh, throwing some material up. And um, so we followed on. So uh, with uh, more observations, we could uh, track some particles and get some measurement about their velocity and whether to see whether they are bound, uh, having a bound or the orbits or uh, even sometimes ejected. So this is interesting. So uh, so far from the uh, beginning, we've got 11 events, uh, with some of them with more than 100 particles. And some of them seem to escape Bennu completely, and then some of them are, uh, seem to have uh, uh, bound orbits and then eventually fall to Bennu. So this is very interesting result we had. And um, so the uh, uh, the the, uh, uh, the idea like why what is the figure of this like not we are not uh, sure about yet. It, um, uh, people um, it, as a matter of fact, the Bennu's perihelion passage was in the uh, middle of January, so. This might be a reason, but we are still like uh, trying to validate, uh, to find, uh, uh, to uh, get better understanding of the phenomenon without like coming to some conclusions uh, premature. So, uh, because this uh, is sort of a uh, meteor shower of beneath, a sort of a gradual Bennu would might be taking place. So, people are going to observe it in, uh, in uh, September uh, this month uh, in the southern uh, southern skies if such a uh, meteor shower is present and um, in case um, uh, to validate uh, uh, any, any particles that uh, might be related to me. So this is a uh, very interesting, but this was also uh, taken with a lot of precaution because of the health, the health of the spacecraft, because of the particles and sizes could, uh, could um, be a of danger to the spacecraft, but the orbit after, uh, after a very thorough analysis, it was decided that they were uh, of not any harm, so then the uh, spacecraft or the, uh, orbit uh, plans are like now in progress, now in progress. The sizes uh, of these particles are being ejected to be, uh, uh, appear to be about a few centimeters. Yeah, uh, now we are um, uh, in the phase of sampling venom, so this is like typical terrain that is present on venom, and uh, the sampling was, all, as I told you before, based on the first estimate, assuming a homogeneous dust cover, smooth uh, regular terrain, and at, uh, as big as about 50 uh, meters in diameter. But uh, 50 meters of Bennu looks like this, so it's, it's not quite clear how we're going to sample. Uh, it means that we have to come up with new challenges and new uh, refining characteristics to um, get the um, uh, accuracy of the pointing and to better understand the digital terrain models to find areas that are smaller and how to get the spacecraft to these areas. Or it could be something like this, it's especially like a bull retreat. And, yeah. and uh, this is one of uh, this is one of the candidates, uh, some precise. So this appear to be uh, uh, better than what we had before. But still, like uh, it's smaller than the, pre the planned uh, oops, orbital uh, uh, operations. So it takes the, a lot of uh, refining of, uh, of uh, the mission plans. And there are two cases, a few cases like this. So, and as of, uh, um, uh, also, this is also important to count the boulders on the experts, so people can get involved with the mission and uh, to, uh, to find the boulders. 
and to, uh, to count them and mark them and to make Google maps. Uh, so this is like a plan, uh, citizen science, scientist program. So people have interest, they can get involved in this. And as of yesterday, uh, the four final candidate sampling sites were announced. So um, after a lot of investigation, first we had about more than 50 of them. So we used uh, this uh, citizen uh, scientist uh, program made in CosmoQuest to find to, to get people to look at the images and to find potential areas that would be interesting for sampling. And also, um, most of these sites were characterized in the northern hemisphere of the asteroid. And then um, uh, people, uh, scientists, we know people the, this, uh, who are in the mission also, they were using their, uh, using the image, looking at the images and trying to find areas of interest. And also, we also used a machine learning approach to find several sites. And we, after about 50 of these, and getting uh, uh, the uh, spacecraft trajectories, combining them with the uh, orbital mechanics of how to get these areas and the probability of uh, security, of secure sampleability. The, um, so how it sampling happens is that the spacecraft comes to uh, um, from its uh, from an orbit to about uh, sort of a geosynchronous orbit with Bennu about at about an altitude about 30 meters, and then it would descend uh, slowly and get the samples during five seconds, and then like go away. In case during this descent there is a mechanism to abort in case something unexpected happens. So. The idea is that you will just fire away and get out of the orbit and uh, be back and reevaluate the situation and then uh, attempt uh, better or even go for different sampling sites because security is the first to get the samples back to the Earth without any problems. So because of this, uh, people are like still evaluating how, it, uh, how the chances are of uh, getting spacecraft uh, safely to these places. So after the 50 of about six sites, we got to about 16 of them. And then uh, now we get these four sites, as you see. Here. So these are there are about three sites in the northern hemisphere. Two of them are close to the equatorial ridge, and then one uh, about 56 uh, degrees of latitude, and then uh, one down below about 44 degrees. So if you look at them closely, uh, this um, area you have this kind of uh, area with a very low albedo. And um, uh, sort of like fine grain material. Here is the uh, site we looked at before. And here is the uh, uh, site. So these are the four base sites. So um, starting from several weeks in September, we are starting to uh, get their low pass orbits and even to make better views <coughs> of these areas and to characterize um, spectrally. With higher uh, special resolution, and to uh, nail down on two sites, one as a primary and one as a backup, by December, and from next year beginning, then we will do uh, rehearsals to come down and use uh, landmark trackings to uh, autonomously guide the spacecraft as accurately as possible, and then to uh, go for the final touch uh, and go in uh, Chile. This is there where they spread it to surface. And this is the, the first site, so this is called Nightingale. There are like several nicknames used in the context. And this is, uh, um, these are four different beeps of this site, a different uh, observation and orientation conditions. So uh, it has the lowest albedo. And uh, this site also happens to have the highest color variation and the finest of, of grains present. And this is the second site called uh, King Fisher. So uh, the names all come from Egyptian mythology as for the sites and birds' names also uh, origin to um, its relations to Egypt. So this is uh, uh, appears to be a young crater. And um, uh, this also has the highest uh, absorption bands uh, of 2.7 microns in this site. And this is the other site. And uh, this is um, called Osprey. And, it's also having the highest organic uh, spectral signature after about three microns, and uh, shows uh, high albedo and other color variations. And if you notice, it's like also like interesting structure. I would like to point out. Uh, it's 
to like we have in the student of this structure, how this structure that is end up in this sort of homogeneous part from the most focused strands. Uh, yeah, and the, 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 the fourth side is being this, so it happens to be like inside a bigger crater and uh, might have, uh, because of another crater that is caused by, it might contain some ejected material from uh, intact. And, um, there are hydrogen materials that are present. And so this uh, forward go into detail. And um, to say that the ground truth, or truth about the Bennu in the context. So current I understanding is that the Bennu had the progenitor, which had, might have contained uh, material that which contained material from the solar system and formed the some pre-solar grains. And uh, so it was the main belt and then this progenitor got like collisionally disrupted, and then we move forward from uh, re reaccumulation of this material, and then uh, as a uh, result of the Arkowski effect, it's, uh, or its orbit got uh, uh, in resonance in uh, resonance with the giant planets, and then it's got kicked uh, over to the inner solar system, uh, where uh, we are now trying to solve it. So this is the current understanding, and we're going to have to wait and see what this happens.